I want to begin by introducing our panelists for uh, this morning. I'm delighted to welcome Ryan Streeter. Ryan's been a part of our American Project on the Future of Conservatism since we began back in early uh, 2017. He is the Director of uh, Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where he oversees research in education, technology, housing, poverty studies, workforce development, and public opinion. Before joining AEI, he was the executive director of the Center of Politics and Government Governance at the University of Texas at Austin. And you see here, there his experience at all levels, from uh, the city to state, and of course, at the federal level as well. Holly Kuzmich is the executive director of the George W. Bush Institute, where uh, she oversees work on education reform, military service, economic growth, human freedom and democracy, global health, and women's empowerment. Kuzmich also oversees the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, which is a, a unique leadership development program in collaboration with the Clinton Foundation, George H.W. Bush Foundation, and the LBJ Foundation as well. Um, Holly brings more than 20 years of public policy experience serving in positions uh, across the sectors in government, uh, the private sectors, and the nonprofit sectors. Michael Hendricks also has been involved in uh, the work of the American Project since our beginnings. Uh, he is the Director of State and Local Policy at the Manhattan Institute. Uh, previously, Michael was the Senior Director of Research and Emerging Issues at the United States Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Michael is a frequent public speaker and writer um, of opinion and research pieces in uh, places like the National Review, City Journal, and National Affairs. And Andy Smarrick. Andy is a senior fellow also at the Manhattan Institute, where his work focuses on education, uh, civil society, and the principles of American conservatism. Uh, he was recently confirmed by the Maryland State Senate earlier this year for a term on the Maryland Higher Education Commission. Previously, Smarrick was a senior fellow and director of the Program on Civil Society Education and Work at the R Street Institute, uh, also based in Washington, DC, as well as a, a mortgage fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and as you can see, Andy also brings uh, experience working at the state and federal levels. And so with that, I will stop our screen share and welcome you all back into this conversation. Delighted to have you all with us. Um, again, this is the uh, third webinar in a series of webinars we're hosting here through the Graduate School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University, titled The Quest for Community. Obviously, the title is derived from the uh, pivotal work uh, by uh, the sociologist and Californian. Um, uh, why am I zoning? Nisbet. Um, Ro uh, Robert Nisbet, who wrote the book Quest for Community back in the early 50s, and in many ways framed uh, the discussions around a communitarian conservatism. Odd that he did that as a professor at Cal Berkeley. Uh, hard to believe that there could be conservatives in the faculty at Cal. Um, but uh, he did that, and in many ways it frames the work that we've been doing here at Pepperdine through our American Project. If you'd like to know more about the American Project here at Pepperdine, just simply uh, Google American Project and Pepperdine, or look at the website AmericanProject.org. So today uh, we are hosting a conversation looking at a policy platform for uh, a more communitarian uh, conservatism. And with our uh, scholars, policymakers, and um, uh, policy experts here gathered, I'd like to begin with a, a question just to begin our conversation. Um, the, the phrase communitarian conservatism is one that um, has, has risen and fallen in popularity in conservative circles over the decades. And uh, of course, the argument here of the American Project is that it would be essential to responding to uh, what is widely acknowledged now as increased levels of loneliness and alienation across 
not only the United States, but even the Western world. And so when we think about uh, a policy platform for a reimagined communitarian conservatism, Ryan, I want to start with you. W what is the frame that you're using? What, what are the kind of policy spheres you're thinking about when we talk about a policy platform for communitarian conservatism? Well, thanks, Pete. And it's great to be with everyone um, for this discussion. I'm glad to be a, a part of it, glad to be joined by um, Andy, Holly, and Michael as well, and look forward to hearing from them. Um, uh, it's a great question, and it's an important one for where we sit today, I think, because um, it doesn't get enough, it doesn't get the amount of attention that it needs, given that it has such important consequences, both socially and economically for us as a country. Um, there are a lot of ways we could go with this. I think what, what I would say at the outset is that we're, we're at a time right now, I think accentuated by kind of um, a resurgence of interest in nationalism on the right, um, kind of undergirded by a type of, of populism that's defined differently by, by different people, but is very much a real part of our politics and the policy making that's made possible by our politics. And um, it seems as though the overall kind of language and conceptual framework of communitarianism and localism um, has sort of been vacated from our public discourse. And this wasn't always so. Um, I think it's been um, uh, kind of a phenomenon of our national politics since at least the Tea Party movement on the right, and before that, for sure, on the, the left. And so what I, what I like to do is to be able to go back um, a little bit in time and look at where it wasn't always so, and where my mind focuses and where I think we can learn some lessons from, which is why I'm bringing it up, is that that period of, of um, policy making in the 1990s, and particularly on the front end of the 1990s, where the themes of community, of locality, of individual agency, household, um, and family were very much at the forefront of policymakers' minds. And, and it was true of the, uh, on the right and the left. I mean, there was a, there was a left-leaning version of communitarianism and a right-leaning version of um, civil society and communitarianism, which was very much alive in that era. And it, it didn't just start in the 90s. It, it had its precursors be, before that. There was a lot of experimentation in the 1980s um, in sort of a reaction to the Great Society that kind of paved the way for a lot of policy reforms. And the ones I have in mind are you have school vouchers and the first charter school legislation at the local and state levels in 1991 and 92. Um, we have large scale public housing reform in 1992, which got rid of the kind of the large concentrated gallery style public housing units for um, neighborhood-based mixed income sorts of developments. Um, community policing has been with us for decades, but it really took off in 1994 with a federal law that encouraged local departments to get police officers out of the squad car, stop the command and control kind of system of policing, and, and really focus on prevention through community partnerships. Um, I think we could really learn, relearn some of those lessons today, given what we're, we're going through right now on, on policing and police reform. And then, of course, famously, welfare reform happened in 1996. Mm -hmm. And that devolved authority to states and by extension to localities. And there's research to say that the, to show that the more we devolved authority from the states to the municipal level, the better outcomes we actually saw in moving people from welfare to work. And so in all of these cases, the and this was not a coordinated effort. It wasn't it wasn't the it wasn't just one president or, or, or one public official that pushed this through. It was something more of a movement based on, on a whole bunch of actors sharing some some shared shared ideals here. And, and I think we, we could learn a lot by going back and studying kind of how effective those, those approaches are. So I think as, a, as an overall framework, that's, that's one thing that I would focus on in particular. And I would just say before turning this over to the others that um, kind of a, a second but related point, stemming from the, the work that, um, that Berger and Newhouse did in To Empower People, mm -hmm. um, which first came out in the late part of the 1970s, was republished in the 80s by AEI, I'm proud to yeah. say. Um, uh, they focused on four mediating structures, the family, the congregation, and the voluntary organization. They also focused on the neighborhood. And since that time, there's been an explosion of social science research and a lot of policy experimentation on, on the first three, on the role of uh, families, on the role of faith-based organizations, and on the role of uh, charities or voluntary associations in producing social capital, in producing strong communities. And so there's a lot that we have within that research to learn from. Um, what some colleagues and I are finding is that the fourth mediating structure, which hasn't gotten as much attention, the actual neighborhood itself, also produces positive civil society 
uh, outcomes when mm. neighborhoods are designed well, when people live close to the things they care about, school, church, the store, the park, the things, the things that bring them together. And I think w while we're seeing kind of alarming declines in religiosity and, and, and trends related to household formation, we can actually offset some of those, those negative trends by thinking about how to bring people together in, in, in real communities again. So I think there's a lot for, for people to unpack in that particular concept. And I'm happy to come back to it yeah. later on. But you can see what, what's kind of tying my remarks together is kind of a recovery of the idea of local integrity, local responsibility, local agency at the heart of our policymaking, both at the state level, but also at the federal level. No, that's very good, Ryan. And I, I would just say, and I know this is going to be also one of our themes here for uh, today's conversation is the tie-in between the federal government and uh, and a more local uh, community-based approach to policy. And in some ways, uh, there's been a crowding out. Uh, in other ways, the federal government does have a role, and it may just be stepping bout, back, but as you point out, in areas certainly like uh, policing and public safety, uh, education certainly could be another um, uh, housing could be another, and the welfare reform measure uh, you mentioned before uh, is where you can see a connection between all the levels of government supporting a more community-based approach to policymaking. Holly, I want to come to you now. Um, obviously, you've uh, your work at the at the Bush Institute is is looking across an array of of policy issues that that uh, have relevance at all levels of government. And so the focus on this conversation is about how we can empower our communities. Um, what are your thoughts? What comes to mind as you, thinking, as you think about a more uh, communitarian policy platform? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's good to be with Ryan and Andy and Michael, all people that I've known and worked with at different times in my career. It's fun to be back together with them. Um, so I'll add a couple things from my perspective. You know, one thing is I always, admittedly, I always sort of come at this with a little bit of um, my experience on education policy making. Even though now I work on a broad array of issues at the Bush Institute, I, of course, that's where I, I sort of have the most experience. Um, and so that colors my thinking a little bit on how we think about this issue. And I'd love to talk about that a little bit more. Mm. Um, but one of the things I've really been thinking about in terms of the work we do here um, is, of course, you know, as you think about this role for government, what is it as it, as it uh, compares to, you know, state and local governments and as it compares to civil society and the private sector, um, roles and responsibilities of each. Um, one of the things that struck me, and we've started to do some work on this in our work on democracy here at this Bush Institute, is looking at Americans' lack of faith in institutions and how that might be tied to some of where we are today in terms of policy issues and politics. And we did some work a couple years ago where we looked at people's points of view on their confidence in institutions. Not surprisingly, People's views, people have, you know, very sort of low levels of confidence in um, Congress, in our federal government, et cetera. We've seen that. But what we had also seen was a decline in confidence in some of those institutions that have always traditionally been held in fairly high regard. They, they were still much higher than what you would see in terms of people's confidence in Congress. But People had lower opinions of schools and of the police um, mm -hmm. and of faith-based institutions than we had seen, you know, 20 and 30 years ago. And when we dove into those results, you also saw a real divide when you looked at white versus non-white populations, higher income versus lower income. If you were not white and if you were lower income, you have even lower faith and confidence in these institutions. And I've been thinking about that and, and thinking about, um, what sort of those those that low trust leads to and of course i do think there's some connection there to um you know kind of the populist movement that we've seen on both sides of the aisle um and to agree i, I agree with ryan that this issue of like policy innovation is not necessarily what i would consider very strong right now we've mm -hmm. got kind of a defense of big picture principles like when you look at, you know, the debates going on, it's really these foundational sort of everybody's in their corner defending their, their 
their position as opposed to proffering sort of interesting and innovative ways to address kind of what I would call like the mom and pop issues that people are facing every day. And right. I think there's a little bit of a chicken and egg phenomenon to that. You know, we lack of trust means we don't, is that because we don't have much innovative policymaking? I don't know, but I've been thinking about the connection um, between those two. And as I think about sort of getting back to um, some of these ideas, to me, the role of government really is around putting often guardrails in place, allowing lots of interesting ways to meet outcomes, protecting civil rights, um, protecting the vulnerable, but also ensuring freedom and options and, and different paths to get there. And we sort of lost that to me at the moment. Andy, I want to come to you and thank you, Holly. Um, what is, uh, and you've also done quite a bit of work in education policy, as I noted in your introduction, um, but you've also studied quite a bit the work of civil society and what are the conditions, policy and otherwise, by which uh, civil society can, can flourish in communities. Uh, how do you frame a discussion around a, a policy platform for a reimagined communitarian conservatism. Well, let me begin first by also saying how grateful I am to you and to the other panelists. I feel blessed that I've had a chance to work with all of you in the past. Um, so I'm very grateful. So the way I start is just with this basic question, should policy support civil society? Um, and my answer is yes. We know humans want to associate in small groups and that Americans have a special knack for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is, isn't just like, you know, Aristotle noticing that we're social political animals. Tocqueville noticed that Americans seem to come together just to solve problems organically. He said our towns seem to constitute themselves. I mean, it goes back to Burke talking about our natural small community platoons. Um, even Hayek wrote about how free people spontaneously gather. Um, and one of my favorite references is like the original understanding of social justice from Catholic social teaching is rooted in small groups bound together organically um, with duties and authorities related to the common good. So I start this by saying communitarianism seems to be in our bones. So what is thwarting it? Mm. And I think thanks to Nisbet and some other things I've read, a big part of the answer is that the government um, through action can weaken mediating bodies and similarly, government action too often or too seldom is used to strengthen these mediating bodies. So if you go back to Nisbet, he's really clear after articulating all these other reasons why community has been lost, that ultimately it's the political state that can cause the loss of community. And some of this is purposeful. We know revolutionaries try to cripple dissent, um, abolish mediating institutions. We see this in the French Revolution, communist regimes and things since then. We know that state is often one to do away with voluntary associations so power can run through the state. But there's something much more benign. Often government leaders don't intend to undermine communitarianism. Often they just believe that state action is more efficient than this hodgepodge of voluntary groups. Mm -hmm. um, I, I take my lead often from James Scott seeing like a state and he argues yeah. that you know, the complexity and seeming incoherence of groups and customs stand in the way of technocrats who just aim to bring about order and legibility in some policy domain. Um, and we got to be frank that some leaders just think that old school community groups are backward in their views of morality and faith and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what's really started to motivate me over the past couple of years is this like fundamental idea in the Declaration of Independence. Governments are instituted to protect liberty. And I believe that civil society is indispensable to American liberty. Um, if we're going to be free, we can't only have individuals and Uncle Sam. We have to have something in between. And so therefore, we got to get uh, the government involved in protecting these bodies. So very quickly, let me just give you the three categories that I think about mm -hmm. what, what an agenda should look like. And the first is legal. Um, we need the courts to revive federalism. The Tenth Amendment means something. Enumerated powers mean something. Uh, when the Tenth Amendment delegates powers to the people, uh, that includes citizens and their voluntary associations. We've also seen recent scholarship on the right of assembly under the First Amendment. So we need courts and legislatures to protect the right of very different people um, to form and participate in very different groups in very different, uh, for very different purposes. Mm -hmm. There's also an angle here on what's called group rights that I think should be explored. So my first of three points is just simply 
I believe in a communitarian uh, legal strategy that we probably have ignored for too long. The second mm. is, is just policy. Uh, we need to push power down and out, out of Washington, into communities, out of government, into nonprofit organizations. We can use policy to energize civil society. I typically think that grant programs can um, do too much to get uh, nonprofits as like arms of the state. So I'm much more interested in things like uh, uh, efforts to do tax credit programs or social impact bonds or opportunity zones, anything that enables autonomous non-governmental bodies to really take the lead. So my point here is there are policy mechanisms that are more likely to enable diversity, pluralism, localism than other types of mechanisms. And then my last point is something probably near and dear to your heart, which is um, human capital development. I just think we need a new generation of public servants who think in terms of civil society and subsidiarity. Mm -hmm. I've had seven mm -hmm. government jobs now, and I honestly struggle to name the times when a government leader has said, stop, how will this proposal affect yeah. the mediating bodies of society? Um, government yeah. leaders typically think in terms of how do I get the state to accomplish this goal? And let me put a fine point on this. In my public policy graduate program, we read zero Hayek, Burke, Tocqueville, mm -hmm. Nisbet, Berger Newhouse. We were trained to think as technocrats managing the state through government action. I just think we need policy people thinking, and I'm using Hayek's language here, like gardeners creating the conditions through which the voluntary sector can get things done. Um, the way I always end this is saying policy can help civil society, but we need policymakers who actually care about civil society. Well, thank you, Andy, for describing the curriculum here at Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. I'm grateful for that, including the James Scott, which uh, I seeing like a state is definitely one of our uh, kind of core texts here at the policy school and highly recommend that to anyone who has not read that. And to your point, much of this can be benign, right? It's, it's just simply, as, as Scott <laughs> titled his book, Seeing Like a State, there is just a certain perspective you can take on when you're inside a government apparatus or institution. And I remember, as I, I do a fair amount of work here with local government officials, uh, a friend of mine who until recently was the city manager of Palo Alto, uh, told me one of the hardest jobs he has to do is when one of his residents asks the city of Palo Alto to do something, which he's perfectly capable of doing. He has the budget to do it, but he realizes the residents would actually get more out of doing it themselves to say no. And that's, it, to me, a, it is an incredible leadership skill for those of us uh, who are in or working with those in government to know that even things that you could do uh, in the interest of this garden that you reference, um, it would actually be better for the residents to take it on themselves, certainly allowing through government policy uh, these, these community-based solutions to occur. But, um, but yeah, Nis very interesting. Nisbet even points this out, if you don't mind my adding this. Like he, in the first section of the book, Nisbet actually says the, um, the progressive who aims to do a technocratic approach is almost always right that a central yeah. agency in the short term will be able to do something more effectively and more efficiently than the hodgepodge of local organizations. But that bit, when you take away the purpose, the reason for being of all of these local groups, in the long term, you end up killing this mediating structure, this set of bodies. So in the short term, it looks like you're doing something efficient. In the long term, you end up doing a whole lot more damage. You know, that's, and I'm going to come to Michael here, but it, it, as you say that, Andy, it strikes me, we had a webinar here that I hosted with Rick Cole, who for uh, many years was the city manager um, in Santa Monica and recently resigned uh, over um, essentially an argument about the city budget just in the last couple months. And his argument is where cities are going, uh, which is going to be where, where obviously states are going as well, is that these aren't going to be the capacity for states and local governments to perform services at the levels they had is just not going to be possible. Um, and so in that, finding these new kinds of what could be called cross sector, what could be called community-based solutions, um, where it's not just the government performing it, it is a 
a partnership between civil society uh, and, and to Ryan's point down to the neighborhood and the private sector as well are not just going to be nice to villain kind of uh, dreams. They're just going to be essential and necessary to the performance of public services. Michael, I want to come to you now, and you're obviously based in, in New York, and uh, if there is a city that has, uh, is continuing to weather storms there around how it uh, both understands itself and delivers uh, community-based public services, it is, it is uh, my birthplace, um, New York City. Tell us a little bit about how you're seeing and defining a, a reimagined uh, communitarian conservatism uh, in, in policy? Sure. Well, when I think about policy arenas that first come to mind with communitarian conservatism, um, I, I really have to get concrete and uh, well, actually concrete and timber uh, with housing. And, and, and notice how housing uh, and, and, and tackling the onerous and often useless regulatory regimes preventing housing from getting built and communities from flourishing, even where there's demand, represent a real challenge to the vision that we're articulating here and discussing today. Um, these zoning rules and permitting regimes dictate what you can build, where, and who can live in them. And it results in a whole mess of issues. So you know, they, they raise prices and construction costs far beyond what they otherwise could be. And that results in a growing housing shortage affecting millions now and, mm. and ultimately harming a desire for community. It's like communities all across this country are flunking both Nisbet and Hayek at the same time. <laughs> Second, uh, it changes what places uh, look like, primarily shifting them away from a more uh, traditional, incremental, natural pattern of development. So we get more cul-de-sacs and fewer main streets. Um, they define the size and shape of cities, who can live in them. Uh, cities like San Francisco end up building a wall of unaffordability around them and then relentlessly segregate by uh, wealth and even race. Uh, we also get slower economic growth and less opportunity, yes, which maybe someone traditionally on the right would point out, but also wealth and generational inequalities that are hard to avoid. Um, so the net result end up being zero-sum cities, this kind of, I don't know, Lord of, the Sun, Lord of the Flies scenario that I think undermines the hierarchy and community and authority and tradition that communitarian conservatives, I think, rightfully celebrate. And then they also set up a contest between outsiders and insiders, uh, owners and renters, wealthy and poor, young and old. Mm -hmm. all, all of that to say that today's policies on housing are incredibly destructive to the places that we celebrate as communitarian conservatism, as co communitarian conservatives, and a true threat to a true conservatism of connection which I know the Pepperdine American Project celebrates mm -hmm. and is all about. And, and then interestingly enough, just uh, from a practical standpoint, they represent an interesting alignment between uh, market conservatism that's dominated on the right for years and a cross-partisan arena of agreement with progressives who, and, and those on the left who have been predominantly running cities for the past handful of years and even decades, because they see many of the same problems and even talk about some of the same solutions when it comes to housing. So, so I think when it comes to communitarian conservatism, I think of housing first mm. as a concrete mm. application. It's a natural outgrowth of policies that, uh, that think in terms of localism, as Ryan pointed out from the 1990s. Um, tack tackling housing also uh, leans into and presupposes where the real responsibility in our American project lies first at the street level then at the neighborhood then pointing to our mayors and councils and all those other things that just emanate outward in a in concentric circles of mutual responsibility um you know that that's where land use decisions are made for for good or bad and it's where we should first look for a better way out there's even interesting ideas out there to make decisions to upzone and allow more housing, even at the street or block level that we should take seriously. And I think lastly, it just helps us see where our duties lie in the federalist system. First, local responsibility, then state accountability, and a federal government that sets the ends 
for which civil society is the means. I think that's why housing is a fantastic arena for us to discuss what communitarian conservatism means like in policy and what it means in practice. No, that's very good. Very good, Michael. And, and we're going to come back and, and now explore with each of you a, a few different policy arenas. Um, and, and housing, you're so right. If there's a, a physical manifestation of uh, how we understand our communities, it's, it's housing uh, and land use. Um, the differences, certainly out here in California, <laughs> Uh, between going from uh, Santa Monica to uh, the Palisades or to downtown Los Angeles or Compton, those the way you understand those communities as an outsider is is how you see the housing and and the way a a community is laid out from its downtown outward. Uh, Ryan, you've done some great work, and I know that uh, you're. Uh, done a fair amount of research in the area of economic development. And, and in some ways, this communitarianism uh, can be attacked as being not sensitive to economic flourishing, as, as just a kind of a, a, a longing or a pining for uh, kind of a, a, a Pleasantville uh, mm -hmm. network of, of communities. But you, you, you understand that uh, and have looked at the impact of this community-based approach as actually being a great lens through which we understand uh, economic growth. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I think that the biggest challenge that, that we face is this kind of geographic segregation that's happened, and, and uh, Michael was touching on this you know, as well, which is that um, people are disconnected from opportunity. And some, some of us are overly connected to it. And that's, that's not a, a lifelong thing in the nation, in the lifespan of our country. Um, it's it's, it's kind of come and gone, but it's more, more of a new thing in recent history. To give you a sense of what I mean, um, in 1980, when you look at like the 15 most unequal um, metropolitan areas in the country, most of them are smaller metro areas in the South. The only two that would be considered major metros with populations over a million people were New Orleans and Orlando, Florida. Um, when you fast forward to today, um, the 15 most unequal cities include places like San Jose, San Francisco, New York, Washington, D.C., where I'm sitting right now. And they, none of them were in the top 15 back then. You had a broader distribution of opportunity. And a lot of it is, is connected to this problem that Michael was talking about when talking about housing, which is that people, um, they literally can't move to where, to where the opportunity is. Mm. So I think... I think we need to broaden our conception even of affordable housing to um, encompass a, a concept of affordable neighborhoods and, and to create, create uh, ways in which districts can be revitalized so that people are close to the training that they need um, to kind of realize the vocational potential in a place that they can afford. It doesn't have to be a fancy place, but it needs to be close to where, to where there's opportunity. And so I think there are different ways you can get there. I mean, one of them would be, um, uh, utilizing the opportunity zone concept. Another one would be a regional cities concept, which I've talked about written about elsewhere. Um, and I think, you know, at the, the center of it all is the, the political sort of courage that is needed at the, the municipal level and at the state level to some degree to make the kind of changes that are necessary for that to happen. And a lot of it gets to what Michael was just talking about in terms of affordable housing. And we probably need to rethink, and even a, a dedicated federalist like myself needs to, to be, I think, okay with, and I am okay with, the idea that when the federal government is spending money um, at the city level, and we do this through HUD, we do this through other vehicles, that we ought to not reward cities that are driving up the cost of living um, mm. And, mm. and forcing the federal government to bear the results of, of, of those, those decisions mm. through other kinds of programs. And so, um, there, there, and, and this was what the HUD, kind of the current administration was trying to do through this one HUD rule on fair housing until the president pulled it, um, uh, really as part of a, a campaign and for political reasons. But it was, a, it was an effort to try to use the, uh, the idea that people who make land available more, more um, prolifically and, and more cheaply, um, when they're getting federal resources, they should, be, they should benefit from it. Um, mm. And, and I think there's, there's a, a role for the federal government to play there. But, but really, this is going to be fixed 
by political courage at the municipal level and by mayor starting to copy each other like they've done in the past and like they will always do. Um, we've seen some recent gains in San Diego recently um, yep. through the mayor, Kevin Falconer, they're introducing some new types of uh, changes to the code that would make it easier to say convert a, a single family one acre lot into four units, um, making it easier to take that detached garage and turn it into mother-in-law quarters. These sorts of things that would make it possible for neighborhoods to kind of bounce back. But neighborhoods are central. Uh, they, people need to be able to live in a place not, that's not just a, a place from which they commute to work, but a place where they can, can raise their kids, where they can engage with their neighbors, where they can, can, can be involved. And this is, this, is a, this is a notion rooted in this, this kind of enduring concept of, of human scale. That we just flourish when we live close to and proximately to the things that make life worth living. Um, our houses of worship, our schools, the, the parks where our kids play and where we meet our friends. And we've documented this matters, but this is not a new concept. Uh, yep. The idea that, that community should be scaled is a very old one and actually used to be a, a fundamental concept within a lot of political philosophy in our, in our tradition. I mean, he, you know, Plato actually said the ideal, he had a number for the number of citizens that should be in a community. It was 5,040. Uh, scholars have never been able to figure out why not 5,030 or 5,050. Um, <laughs> but up through Montesquieu and the spirit of the laws, the idea that republics need to be manageable. And this was part of the reason that Madison was wrestling with this notion of a large republic so much in Federalist 10 was to try to balance these objectives for a large, powerful republic with the idea to maintain a human scale through the kind of local checks and balances that we need. So I think we need to be thinking about neighborhoods as a whole. And we also need to be kind of re- uh, envisioning what the federal role is when we're talking about supporting communities. And right now, um, uh, we're not doing enough there. And I think we're paying, paying the price for it. You can kind of measure it. Before I go to you, Holly, uh, Ryan, I just want to come back. Can you be, uh, say again that that rule that came out of HUD that the that looked like it was moving forward and then it got pulled back? Explain that a little bit more. Yeah, so it was a a uh, fair housing rule that was put in place by the Obama administration. And, and, and a lot of critics were rightly alarmed by it, myself included, um, that it would have um, given the federal government too much control over how local uh, communities were actually constituted, particularly on the is issue of, of kind of racial balance and, and, mm. and allowing HUD to basically come in and say, this community is not diverse enough, this one's uh, mm. okay. Mm -hmm. And that gives the federal government kind of a dangerous kind of role in intervening in the, the kind of natural and organic way that communities are constituted. But what the, um, the, the what they're trying to do in the, the Carson HUD was to kind of redo that rule, not eliminate it, but change it uh, to focus more on this, this question of um, the affordability of housing and where um, communities have uh, rules that make it prohibitively expensive to move in there or to build. Um, HUD's formula for awarding things like community development block grants to those communities should, should be based on that. So they opened up for public comment. They got a lot of really interesting and good public comments. Yep. And, um, and then we're, we're thinking about how to now implement that rule when this summer um, President Trump decided to pull it um, because of other reasons. And, and you know, you've heard him talking a lot about the suburbs, one of his ways of protecting the suburbs from having low income housing come in and take them over and, and ruin yes. the suburban lifestyle dream, as he called it, which is something I don't think anyone in the suburbs has ever heard before. But he, uh, you know, he was protecting the suburban lifestyle dream, which I totally support yeah. uh, the suburban lifestyle dream uh, by using this rule, the elimination of this rule is one way to get there. So, you know, there, there were reasons why, why they did that. Um, but I think what they were trying to do, um, while, while imperfect and, and not complete, was to move in the direction that, I, that I've kind of been advocating for. Holly, your work at the Institute has also uh, explored the issue around immigration. And again, uh, I when we've talked about this in earlier Quest for Community webinars, one of the ways in which I think this communitarian approach or this conservatism of connection approach to um, politics and policy is attacked is, is from those who think that this is just a way of uh, returning to very exclusive and exclusionary communities. And I thought what was interesting in our prep call for this is um, your, your work around immigration and the fact that assimilation can often happen at the community level before it's taken on on a more broad-based national level. Obviously, we live in communities. We, we live in a country, too, but, but we live in our communities. 
And even immigrants select communities to live in for particular reasons. They could be, they could be uh, family connection focused, they could be job focused, whatever the case might be. But tell us a little bit about how this uh, communitarian conservatism can actually uh, reinforce or support um, uh, more uh, larger immigrate, immigrant populations within communities. Yeah. Well, number one, let me just say this, I think about the, the debate on immigration right now, which is to me kind of the, the wrong way to look at it. It's, it's mm. very polarizing um, sides to this, which is either kind of looking at legal and, immigra legal and illegal immigration is either all good or all bad. Mm. Um, with no sort of room in the middle to talk about how do we ensure a healthy legal immigration system while also addressing the factors of illegal immigration and figuring out we still have this you know massive problem about what to do with the 11 million people who have been here for a very long time now but did not come through legal channels um so just in terms of the debate, I think there, we've, we've, got to, we've got to actually parse that out a little bit. And unfortunately, we're talking at the margins where it's either, you know, all of it's good or we've got to really kind of crack down on it, whether people are coming legally or not through legal channels. But right. to your point, I mean, civil society has a really important role to play, even though immigration policy is largely, of course, set by the federal government. Um, there are so many groups who take it upon themselves to really work with the immigrant community mm. and, you know, assimilate them into communities across the country. And you mentioned that, you know, most immigrants choose where to go. That's true. Some of them don't. I mean, refugees mm -hmm. are the perfect example where mm -hmm. they're, you know, they usually are go through an agency and sort of land in a city where they might not otherwise have been. And that's where you see civil society of really stepping up to the plate. And I think breaking down some of those barriers that people sometimes have where they think that immigrants to this country are not necessarily, you know, interested in assimilating. Mm. Um, I also just go back to looking at, you know, I, we've hosted naturalization ceremonies here at the Bush Institute. And one of the things that always amazes me when that happens is listening to them take the oath and how I mean, as you know, as an American, it, they have to renounce everything regarding um, their home country. They have to promise to serve in the military if called. I mean, it's a pretty sort of like affirmative, you know, I am an American and I am renouncing everything about where I came from. And so mm. even just that always strikes me as we really put it upon immigrants who are becoming naturalized citizens to our country that is as important for them to become part of the fabric of American life. Very good. Yes, that and and of course that connection, I would argue, uh, happens most easily and understandably um, at that local level, right? It, it's then yeah. through the and it happens so much too through our schools. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, our schools all across this country serve those populations and that's, that's so significantly, especially how, how, you know. And of course, religious institutions as well. I mean, you, you mentioned before that the broader civil society can actually play a greater role in this community-based assimilation right. than governing institutions can. Right. I mean, government can set the rules of, of yeah. our immigration system, but it is really up to civil society to think about how to support immigrants and assimilate them. Andy, I wanna come back to you um, as we think about how we understand the communities in which we live. Um, I wanna talk about one of the challenges that we've seen over these last few years. And that has been the, uh, the near utter collapse of our local media uh, institutions in helping to inform um, community members uh, from about the actions of their local government to uh, celebrations to uh, various policy issues that may be forthcoming and impact them whether it's on education or uh, housing uh, all these other areas 
one of the ways we find out about this is through our local media. And I remember having, I worked on a, some of you might be familiar with the case of Bell, California, which about six years ago was discovered to be the most corrupt city in America um, when the city manager was found to be earning a salary of about a mil, well, earning, I say loosely, receiving a salary of about a million dollars a year. And one of the, when we did the kind of the postmortem and the diagnostic afterwards, one of the th things that we found out is there, frankly, even though it was maybe 15 miles from, uh, or 10 miles as the crow flies from the headquarters of the Los Angeles Times, uh, there was no local media covering these stories. And, um, and so talk a little bit about some of your, your thinking on the importance of these local media institutions in both informing um, the public and also engaging them at the, at the community level. And are there any policy solutions um, that, that can support um, uh, the sustainability of local media? Yeah, I try not to be too alarmist about too many things or advocate for too much dramatic action. But the loss of local media is one of those areas, like uh, similarly, like the loss of civics education, where I think that uh, if it doesn't have to be a federal initiative, it should be national, as in a bunch of us get together and realize that this is a problem. Mm. Um, I start from the point of view that I think that we are both atomized and centralized at the same time. People are feeling mm -hmm. disconnected from one another, and people have written about this for hundreds of years. When people are separated from one another, they have a tendency to try to find community somewhere. Often the state, the faraway state, is the thing that's given to them. Hence, we have despots, we have populism, we have nationalism. The way that you uh, forestall that is by having these mediating structures that get people close to home. I mean, Burke's point about platoons isn't just that it's the thing that we know and love. It's the thing that we feel comfortable in. So then we can have love for things further away. Local mm -hmm. institutions root us, they ground us, they make us feel comfortable. Uh, and it turns out that um, prior to COVID, over the past, like since 2004, I think, America had lost one in five of its newspapers. Since about the same time, newspaper staff had been cut in half. So not only did we have fewer newspapers, the ones that still existed um, were short staffed. So for example, the paper that I grew up on, the Annapolis Capitol, they don't really have a building anymore. They um, really don't have staff to cover the high schools like they used to, or to cover the state legislature like they used to. And the New York Times ran a story about this and the sub headline was, our community doesn't know itself anymore. And I think that this mm -hmm. is profound, um, this idea here that like, if we don't want people to continue looking to Washington, D.C., if we don't want people to keep having conspiracy theories, if we don't want people to just get all of their news from Facebook or from cable uh, news like that incites them, we need something local to keep them grounded um, and knowing their communities. And so I think the loss of these newspapers is is serious. It's something that we need to take very seriously. And whether or not that means, I mean, philanthropists have tried to do something about this. Um, mixed results so far. I don't know if there's a tax credit program to do something, but if I want to be involved in my community right now where I live, I have a hard time knowing what the county council is doing. I have a hard time knowing what the school board is doing. I have a hard time mm -hmm. knowing who the superstar student at the high school is. 20 years ago when I was growing up, my local newspaper told me those things. So if we want people to be rooted in their communities, we need mechanisms to tell them what's there. And the more we um, what I said in our like a pre-meeting about this is I used to think the loss of community led to the loss of media. Now I think it's the other way around. The loss of local media, if it's not there anymore, that can tend to lead to the loss of community. Oh, I don't know the people around me. I'm going to attach to this online group or this nationalist plan. And I think that's dangerous. Pete, I'll just, I just want to echo what Andy said. I mean, that's such a good yeah. point really tested research any question of governance and community. And I think you find that uh, turning off the lights of local media leaves communities in the dark. You have local finances that go increasingly out of control, borrowing costs go up, uh, crime clearance rates uh, go down, uh, partisanship goes up. And so it should concern us that, uh, I think at one last count, more than half of counties in America had at least had just one newspaper or one media source. 
and a growing share have none at all. And then an increasing share, almost an overwhelming share of reporting journalists are concentrated in just three cities, New York yes. City, yeah. DC, and LA. And I think that that is incredibly destructive. It also shows what is so important about our conversation today. Uh, it's when we say that no local news is bad news, it should point to the kind of solutions that we're talking about today. No, I think that's a, it's a, it's a, such an important point about how we, how we can understand ourselves. I call it the C-spanification of, of our news is that DC just becomes the, the central hub for how we understand politics. And I, I want to take this moment to let our, uh, our viewers and participants know that please enter your questions. I see one question coming from uh, Policy School alum, Aaron Rodewald, is just about, is it possible even to have this conversation given how polarized we are? But in, I, I think it's fair to say that when the focus is almost about our politics almost entirely is on national politics. Um, then it, we become unable to really see the things that impact us. And uh, I, I know I tell this story often. I don't think I've told it in one of these, these webinars, but um, I, until recently, and when I moved on to campus here in Malibu, I was one of uh, five Republicans who, who lived in the People's Republic of Santa Monica. And and there were a whole array of issues I know with my neighbors, we were never going to agree on at the top of a, any sort of say presidential or congressional uh, voting ballot. But when it got more local, whether it was uh, schools or land use planning, the types of things that we're talking about, all of a sudden it became, there was a lot more overlap in the things that we cared about. And frankly, the reasons why we loved the place in which we lived, um, you know, and I didn't think about it until just this moment. Um, it's a lot easier to love the place and where we where we live than it is to love, frankly, our country. And I hope that came out right. I mean, I love our country, but in this era, there's so much fracturing and polarization and argument going on about who we are as Americans. Um, but when you get to a more local level and participate in more local institutions, the ability to say why you love that place, um, I think is an essential beginning point to discuss places where reform needs to happen, right? I don't, I don't think, and this is, again, a lot of my work at the local level, the person who parachutes in from outside as the activist and says, you all need to change this issue on affordable housing or public safety or whatever is not going to have near the resonance as someone who has been there or at least says, I love this place, but we still need to change in this way. Um, and it starts with a love of that place, which I think is so important um, to our politics. Um, but also uh, to our policy making. This is so, the heart of civic virtue. I mean, this yeah. goes back thousands of years, which is we now have a tendency to think of public services as the way that the servant can shape the public. But there's this much more ancient Republican tradition, smaller Republican tradition, that public service is meant to shape the public servant, him or herself. That by virtue of doing things locally, like today we would talk about seeing the person we disagreed with at the local soccer game or at the grocery store. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're engaged with one another, not like as avatars, not as someone who we just see on TV, but the person who goes to church with us or that we are volunteering with or we're, we see at the parade. And it's a whole lot harder to detest someone that, that is up close. I mean, is it Lincoln or Will Rogers, this idea of, um, I don't like that man, I need to get to know him better? Yeah. Um, you, you don't have that impulse when everything is far away, but civic virtue tells us to serve and to serve locally, and that makes us better citizens, and it makes us better to one another, and enables us to help our communities uh, if I could inject something in today's public service, it's that don't go to Washington, D.C., serve your community. It will make you a better person, it will make your community stronger. 
There's yeah, also this I, point I, that I, as we have this growing belief that the rights agenda for the past handful of generations hasn't lived up to its promise, one result of that has been a search for a kind of new nationalism. And there's many different brands of nationalism. Some are rooted in great national projects, others in forms of patriotism, but there's also a form of nationalism grounded in local roots, grounded in localism. Yeah. And that is a way in which we can have love for our country, to your point, Pete, and I think we too often forget that. I think it's worth pointing out too that we are um, really derive a lot of our identity from the communities in which we live too. I mean, we we find this mm. this out in our in our survey research when we ask people if they get a strong sense of community from a variety of different things, and the average American still gets a stronger sense of community from their neighborhood or the community where they live than they do their political ideology or their race. And you wouldn't know that by consuming most media today. And I think it's it's just it's fundamentally the, the case. And to the original question of, you know, can, can we can we make progress in this age of polarization? I think it's it's true that you you can't you simply cannot talk to the parents of your your kids on the soccer sidelines the same way you do on Twitter. It's just not possible. You know, mm -hmm. and for those of us who lived in places where th those parents typically come from the different end of the ideological spectrum. I know that's that's true for me. And we Yep. We've always lived in very blue places. I've raised my kids in cities. They've never had a backyard or garage. They're very, they're kind of urban rats. And 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 uh, progressives just make better neighborhoods. So I always move into them. And <laughs> um, and the uh, you know and so all the, the the parents on the sidelines really don't come at the political and policy issues the same way I do. But I've always been able to have conversations with with people that are that are productive. At the end of the day, if you're worried about the new math curriculum the school just implemented and whether or not it's the right thing for your kids and are you going to show up at the community meeting this week, you're all going to go do that together. And so I think it really does argue for uh, the need to kind of rethink our policy responses to some problems that force people into that situation more. So that civic virtue becomes, like Andy's talking about, it, a real thing that is required or at least the opportunity to exercise it is there because you can't exercise civic virtue in the abstract. Um, yeah. You can't just show up at a protest and be civically virtuous. These people running around D.C. in these neighborhoods close to where I live, forcing people to adopt an ideological stance in, in response to the protests are, are they're not practicing civic virtue. They're not well, they're going to leave that, that that moment of intimidation where nothing's changed. And the situation of the community is not any different than before they got there. It might even be a little worse. And so without without creating the preconditions for that kind of engagement in our policy, we probably won't make progress. But but optimistically, I think we can make progress if we realize that when you do actually put people in those situations, they rise to the occasion. That's why early on I mentioned, I mean, welfare reform, we saw that, community policing, we saw, we saw that. We created the incentives for people to take responsibility for solving problems close to their home. And guess what? They actually did it. Yeah. No, those are all really good points, Ryan. And And... I wanted to come to you, Holly. We had another question um, from another one of our alums here at the Policy School, uh, State Senator Hans Zeiger from Washington State, um, thinking about uh, who is it at the national level who is uh, promoting and, and um, highlighting these themes. We did an event through this American project last year uh, in collaboration with Senator Mike Lee's office, um, who's taken up leadership of the Joint Economic Committee and essentially transformed what was kind of a very technocratic um, uh, institutional body into one that is looking at issues of, of loneliness and community and how we support that. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, it, the role that the federal government or even places like uh, uh, Senator Lee and uh, Ben Sass that are arguing for uh, this more communitarian conservatism, who, who are the folks out there you think we should know about? Yeah, well, I think you, you mentioned, you just mentioned Ben Sass, who I would have put on the list, who I think is very strong in this, but it's an uphill battle for him. He's one of, you know, a very few kind of talking about this. I'd put somebody like Tim Scott on the list too, who, mm. um, your thoughts on, on the, it just triggers a thought about the opportunity zones. It's something that Ryan had uh, mentioned before. Uh, is, is that an example, a, a glimmer of hope there again, in how the federal government can incentivize this more community-based approach to uh, policy? I think generally, I, I, you know, I'm an advocate for them in, in terms of seeing what can be done with a, with a policy lever like that 
Um, I just, can I make one other point that's related yeah. to the conversation we were having about sort of, you know, on the ground local politics and neighborhoods and discussions and this issue of housing. One of the things that I think is, you know, Pete, to your point, when you get down to the local level, I think some of those partisan divides go away and you find yourself either aligned or not, not based on party, but based on a whole host of just kind of things that matter to you personally. But I look at things like housing issues and Ryan, you mentioned, you know, some of the things in San Francisco, like, but you know, we need to move in, in some neighborhoods from single family housing to more multi unit housing, like we just have to think creatively about things like that. But one of the things that that's a challenge at the local level, I think, is that you often then get individuals who say, you know, not in my neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do you balance that, um, that communitarian approach where um, people might theoretically understand where we need to go on some policy issues, but they're not necessarily, you know, an advocate of it personally. And you have to figure out at, as local elected officials and leaders how to navigate those conversations. Um, we, we see it in education all the time where, you know, parents love their neighborhood schools. That's natural. Yep. Um, but, but they sometimes are not, you know, doing all they can for all kids. And so how you navigate those conversations, and I've learned a lot of lessons over 20 years of doing education policy that that's, it. those are tough things to do from a public policy perspective because people love their schools, but yet they need to improve. And how you think about navigating that at the local level is challenging. And if you try and do it too much from the state and federal level, as I have some, you know, um, uh, wounds from, it can be really <laughs> Well, and I'll, I'll just interject there. Um, and I'm, I want to come to you, Andy, next. Again, continuing to encourage our participants, we got some great questions coming in. Um, you know, we are, at least in housing policy, I think California is is a basket case, really. I mean, we, we essentially are uh, an adventure in doing all the wrong things. Uh, recent estimates show that we are uh, at least um, several million units short. And one of the things, again, uh, uh, that I talk about because we do a, a fair amount of consulting with local governments who want to grow their housing supply um, in response to many of the issues that both Ryan and, and Michael have talked about is, is to make the argument not about the issue. If you start with a discussion that says, we need 3,000 or 3 million more units of housing here, that is absolutely the wrong way to go. If you say, do you want your kids to be able to buy a house and live here in this community? All of a sudden, you are having a completely different conversation. I remember an event we hosted around housing policy up in Salinas, California, uh, uh, the home of uh, John Steinbeck on the central coast of California. And we did this public engagement process and it was around housing. It had a lot of technical jargon in it, but not too much. And at the end, of, I remember a resident standing up and saying, you know, I'm, I'm glad I learned so much about the budget and about housing policy and what's going on here and where I live. But I have to say, I don't really care what the council or the planning commission does. I just want a community that my daughter can afford to live in after she graduates high school. And I've found that when you break it down to those very kind of personal needs, as opposed to the technocratic, you know, how many units, you know, what, what is the building height and the setback and all the necessary parts of housing policy, uh, you're in a much different place. Because especially here in California, you can go into almost any coastal community and ask the 60 somethings what their biggest pain is about living in California, and it's that their kids don't live anywhere near them. And uh, so I think there is a way of framing some of these issues that, yes, NIMBYism is real and operative and determinative of a lot of local housing policy, 
But at the same time, I think if you flipped it and focused on a conversation about how do we grow in a way that's consistent with who we are as the city of Fresno or Hyattsville, Maryland, or whatever the case might, or uh, Plano, Texas, um, it's, it becomes a much, a much different conversation. And Michael, you talk about that a little bit in, in thinking about housing uh, that, that fits within particular communities and their own identity. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to point out that when we just did a poll at the Manhattan Institute of New York City, a place where we have not seen housing growth anywhere near the kind of demand. In fact, we're building less housing over the past decade than we did during the Great Depression, amidst a time until the coronavirus of incredible economic growth, that even still something like 59% of New Yorkers, according to our poll, supported loosening land use regulations. It's a question necessarily of who's speaking out on land use and housing, and it's a question of at what local level are decisions being made and are they actually representative of communities or regions and actually representative of what people would want for their own family, their own household, their own kids or parents. You know, and I, I think that one thing that we've seen is an opportunity for incremental advancement, uh, the opportunity for more missing middle housing to be developed. Missing middle would be duplexes, triplexes, the kind of accessory dwelling units and backyards. They may not always get the big headline numbers. You know, in California, we talk in millions of units of new housing that need to be allowed. But, you know, even in Los Angeles, when it permitted more ADUs to be built, you had within a single year, a 30 fold increase in ADU applications. Some of them, by the way, were just illegal ADUs trying to be legalized, but nevertheless, there's just incredible demand there. Yeah. And that incremental progress, I think, is not only part of what uh, co conservative vision for community is really all about, but also did represent concrete improvement and showed to people who even would say not in my backyard, that when these new developments do come, maybe in proximity to your backyard, it does not actually change drastically the makeup of, of the neighborhood. Mm. Um, it, in fact, though, allows for a place to grow and for a community to flourish all at the same time. That's really good, uh, Michael. Um, and I just, as a time check, we're into our last uh, five minutes here and I'm about to drop a, a 20 minute question, <laughs> but, um, but it's a good one. And I, it comes from our friend uh, Ovik Roy, who uh, has been a part of the work of the American Project since we got underway here back in, in 2017, and it is dealing with the reality that there have been racist exclusionary policies, not only at the federal level or state level, but at the more community level. Um, I'm thinking, of course, of things like redlining to just pull out the, the housing issue again, certainly around education policy um, that have been localize and and holly i'm sorry to come to you but i think you're you you mentioned something before about how we balance civil rights with community responsibility i think we're all agreed that if we were to look at the pendulum upon which policy is made between the centralized federal government and more communities we the pendulum has swung more towards uh the federal government but on issues of civil rights and, and frankly, <laughs> America's founding principles, uh, they have been squelched by, by community institutions. And so I wonder how you think about, as, and whether it's in the discussion around immigration or not, but, but how you think about uh, the importance of um, maintaining support for civil rights uh, in the American context and making sure that they are not uh, diminished by our own call here at the American Project for greater community policy making. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I'm actually going to say that 
part of this just goes to good leadership overall. And when mm. you asked that question a little bit ago about like who are, who are the people we should know about, I mean, it's it's good local, state, and national leadership, in my view, who um, who really needs to keep an eye on that. Meaning that, like, if you look at you know, I'm sitting in Dallas, Texas, where the city overall does pretty well on opportunity and growth, but we have a very segregated city and redlining is a huge part of this, the history of Dallas. And we have a very, you know, segregated South Dallas with not much opportunity um, for people there. And so that is not something, you know, where we need the federal government to necessarily come in, but we do need good local leadership over time to really sort of, uh, uh, advance new opportunities in our community and think creatively about policy solutions as others have talked about, not just at the city level, but at the neighborhood level. Because when you look at cities or regions or sometimes at the state level, you can get a, a not very accurate picture of what's happening at a neighborhood by neighborhood level, I think, in this country. And I see it very much um, here in the city of Dallas where, you know, um, you've really got to take that approach and thinking about it and, mm. and you really need good sort of effective leadership who understands to your point also how to communicate sort of a vision for what we're trying to achieve Yes, and rally people together to move there. Yeah, I think that's and, good. And, um, maybe Ryan, I come to you because I know, uh, and our, again, our friend Avik uh, raises this, that Scott Winship, who has just left the JEC to join you all there at AEI, has done some of this research as well in, in some of the disparities in communities um, around economic opportunity. Um, your, your thoughts on how we, how we balance just looking at the, the economic opportunity um, and, and how communities can overcome some of these, these legacies. Yeah, well, and to Ovik's very good question, I mean, it it's, seems quite evident that um, racial segregation in a lot of our cities, our fastest growing cities, has gotten worse. Um, and so have um, concentrations of poverty. I mean, you're, uh, since 1980, I mean, you're basically, if you're poor, you're three times more likely to be living in a neighborhood, you know, with poor people around you than, than previously, or you're, you're gonna be around a more concentrated set. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, people, uh, low-income communities, low-income households, people of color, you know, have been isolated from being able to move into places where there is vibrant opportunity. And I, and I, and I don't think that it's, you, you can actually find one sort of ideological or, or partisan approach to this. It's, it's happened in all cities, and, and it's, it's happened in cities even that would um, be self-described as progressive, where you have these, these very discriminatory practices when it comes to deciding who can live where. Mm. And, um, and, and we also, I think, have seen that in the way that school district lines are drawn and enforced and, and over time you have some of these same problems. But I think the, you know, the challenge is, to, is really to not, I, I have a hard time finding sort of a race-based strategy on this or something that, that would, would, would be akin to like affirmative action. I think you have to double down and do some of the things that we were talking about, which is to make housing more accessible and affordable to more people. And then also have a very sort of family-based and individual-based approach to um, personal economic development. And so uh, making mm -hmm. it easier for people to move closer to where they need to get the certifications and the training and to allow them to finish uh, where they move to. And so that, that just means rethinking the way our workforce development system, for instance, provides support to people. It should be moving away from institutions to individuals and be helping them um, do life while they're while they're finishing their training and getting connected to the kind of employment that they need which right now it's too hard to use some of those resources for and so we mm -hmm. continue to fund sort of inefficient um institutions that really aren't getting the job done so i think that the and we've learned a lot from the school reform movement in this i mean when when you give people the opportunity to to move and to have different opportunities and options in their community they often take you up on that i mean i've been around washington dc now to know the pre and post sort of charter school kind of environment that's here and it's a totally different landscape than it was when i first moved here mm. um, in 2001. so um uh, when you give people the the ability to actually move into better communities communities where they want to be um and you provide resources in a way that allow them to do that that's that's usually the best way out of this conundrum i think right 
Can I add just one quick thing to this? Sure. We're almost at the close, but go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I'll, I'll be fast, which is, uh, this is a very real thing. And I think those of us on the right need to take this seriously, that while we are recognizing the need for localism, I mean, Putnam pointed this out, and it's, it's tough for a bunch of us to grapple with, that um, diversity doesn't always automatically lead to people accepting one another as much and as quickly as we would want. As a matter of fact, it can lead to in-group and out-group behavior. Yes. People um, uh, retreating and participating less in public life and othering other people and having solidarity with their like groups. I think we have to be absolutely energetic as possible on civil rights rules and make sure that uh, there are no vestiges of racism in the policies we have. But also the way we overcome this, I think has to be being unembarrassed about readopting this language of e pluribus unum, of whether it's melting pot, pot whether it's um, a city on a hill. You can simultaneously have differences among people and realize that people want safety and they want security and they want solidarity, but you have to give them a narrative and say differences are good. There's pluris, there's pluribus among us, but there is something that brings us together. So mm -hmm. while we're saying localism and allowing self-determination, we have to have this American narrative of we are in this thing together and you may look different you may come from a different place but you're still my brother you're still my sister we're all citizens of this country and i think the danger is if we only talk about self-determination localism without talking about this overarching national we're citizens we're brothers and sisters we got to come together um we can lead to some of these bad outcomes that we've seen for uh, too many generations well it would be hard to end on a better note than that and um the the connection between a more communitarian conservatism and back to Michael's point about much of the conversation around so-called national conservatism, uh, there is a part of understanding uh, who we are from a national perspective that actually celebrates this communitarian conservatism. And so I take your point, Michael, I thought that was extremely well put. And that certainly is the mission of this American project, uh, again, based here at Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, which is uh, very unfortunately located in Malibu, California. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ryan, thank you, Holly, thank you, Andy, thank you, Michael. I'm so glad to count you as, as friends and, and colleagues in this work. I wanna thank all of you for joining us. I know that we had many um, who registered for this who were not able to join. And so as usual, we'll be following up within 24 hours with the video from today's conversation. And so as a way of further promoting this work, um, we invite you to share the video link that you'll receive with uh, folks in your network. I think it is fair to say that this is a, a unique set of conversations that we're having here at the American Project. Uh, we are scheduling our next Quest for Community webinar. I'm delighted to see my co-director and friend, Rich Taffel, in the audience here today. And he's going to be leading this next one on, on how we understand ourselves to live in community. How do we do what, what Michael has called celebrate uh, the places in which we live and to do it in a way that is actually inclusive and inviting while at the same time uh, encouraging local civic participation. So again, thanks so much for joining us. For more information, again, you can uh, just search the American Project at uh, Pepperdine and uh, our AmericanProject.org uh, contains a lot of the writing that we do as well as our channel uh, of essays at Real Clear Policy. So from Malibu, thank you all for joining us. I look forward to seeing you at our next Quest for Community webinar. Thanks and goodbye.